Good evening. Welcome to the international webinar at Believers Church Medical College Hospital. A warm welcome to all our faculty, students, delegates, our international diaspora and education partners. Today, we have a pertinent session on precocious puberty. Our international guest speaker for the day is a practicing pediatric endocrinologist in Michigan, USA. She holds a clinical faculty position as assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Oakland University William Dumont School of Medicine. She is American board certified in both pediatrics and in pediatric endocrinology metabolism. After completing medical school in PSG IMSNR India, she completed her residency in pediatrics at St. John Providence Children's Hospital, followed by a fellowship in pediatric endocrinology at Virginia Commonwealth University, where she developed a keen interest in pediatric thyroid cancer. She is an ardent advocate for children with type 1 diabetes and serves on a voluntary basis at the annual diabetes summer camps conducted by the American Diabetic Association. She is a reviewer for the journal Clinical Pediatrics and is consistently recognized by her peers as one of our Detroit Magazine's top docs in her field. Primarily a clinician, she is the co-principal investigator of an outgoing pediatric drug trial for treatment of type 2 diabetes in children. A regular presenter at the Endocrine Society meetings, her special areas of interest include pediatric thyroid cancer, pubertal disorders, and monogenic forms of diabetes. Dr. Shabana, it's a great privilege to have you with us today. We have with us the Senior Consultant of Endocrinology at Believers Church Medical College Hospital, Dr. Philip Finney. After completing undergraduate medical education at the prestigious CMC Velour, he went on to do his post-graduation in general medicine and specialization in endocrinology from the same institution. He has obtained a two-year MTI fellowship of the Royal College at Basildon University Hospital at Essex, UK. He's actively involved in research and has many international publications to his credit. Recipient of many excellent awards and a brilliant clinician, may I invite our moderator for the day, Dr. Philip Finney, to take over the session. Over to you, sir, Dr. Philip Finney. Good evening and good morning to Shabana as well. It's my privilege to uh, moderate the session which uh, we'll be having on a topic called precocious puberty, which is very familiar to endocrinologists, but sometimes not that commonly seen among the rest of the fraternity. And I know that today we have many medical students and pediatricians and practitioners who are attending this talk. And I'm really excited. I'm sure it will be a worth the effort and the time which we're going to spend to understand a good approach and an evaluation to sexual precocity. I just say a couple of words before I hand over to Shabana and uh, sexual precocity is quite a scary problem if a parent or a mother and a father come to us with a child who suddenly developed breasts at a very young age or had a period at the age of three or four years it can be quite shocking to the family the family is usually quite confused devastated when they come to us and so it's very important to be empathetic to try to understand and to arrive at an accurate diagnosis as to what the cause is is it a central cause is it a peripheral cause is there some exogenous substance which is leading to this problem, particularly in this era where we have a lot of endocrine disruptors in the environment, in the diet. We need to be extremely cautious how we go about the approach to the management of this problem. And so compared to delayed puberty, which is a much more common problem we see, I think sexual precocity at warrants careful attention to the history and then of course to the examination and the evaluation follows. So I'm not going to uh, go further in detail I'm going to hand over to Dr. Shabana to take us through this session. And at the end of the session, we will be inviting questions. But if you have questions, I encourage you to please put the questions on the chat box so that we can get the questions in place so that at the end of the session, Shabana would be happy, I'm sure, to answer many of these questions. So it's my privilege, Shabana, to welcome you to this talk. And I really look forward to having a useful time with you. Please take over the session. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, I'm checking my audio, but hopefully you can hear me. And this is yeah. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. When Jacob asked me to do a, a session, uh, I was um, quite happy to do so. I, I enjoy teaching and 
Uh, I am 100% uh, in clinical practice, but uh, I am in a teaching position. So this is something I really enjoy. And it's a nice way for me to connect with uh, an update on how things are uh, back, back home and how the practice is. And hopefully this will be useful. Uh, let me try, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, are you able to all see my, my screen? No problem, I just wanna do a check, okay. Yes. So I'm gonna just do, uh, the view is, I'm gonna to try to do, I should select speaker view, right? The view is good actually, it's full screen. Okay, all right, so, uh, what I want to talk about today is precocious puberty, which is an uh, and really an overview of evaluation and management. Um, now, am I? I'm looking when I'm looking at this view. I don't see. I see four uh, four windows. Is that what I should be seeing? Sorry, I don't want to. No, four windows of what? There's one of me, one of Doctor. No, Kinney. you're not supposed to. Uh, on your right. Side top, right side top. You see a I can call view or something like that. Um, yeah, it's. I have on your right side top. And I might have to stop the share and say view, and then speaker view. Okay, speaker right. view is fine. That is perfect. And now start sharing the screen. Sharing. Okay, I still see all four. I, I see a lot of you on my top right corner. Yeah, so that means you will have to swap actually switch to the other. I mean, again, on the on right side top, you, are you able to see anything? I mean, when you go or in the middle of your screen, just go up. Yeah. Stop, stop sharing. Yeah. There will be a lot of options. No, you stop sharing actually. Yeah, I stopped sharing. No, you, you share your screen and yeah. then you go up there. Yes, I'm, I'm sharing, but I still see all of you on my top just, screen. Just, okay, no problem. Now what you do is just go on top, middle. Yeah. Just pass through that green color thing and you will see a lot of options when you go on top. Do you see that? I will come up. Yes, yeah, pause share. Um, you are screen sharing, it says. Okay, anything else? Uh, really nothing else. I mean, I have more. It says uh, hide the video panel or? Uh, no. Uh, okay. I'm just coming. I see all of you on my screen, so it's just, you know, it's on my slide, so I'm not able to read my slide. Yeah, I understand that. I can move forward with this. I, I'm not sure why I see all your, you know, I see Starkey Thompson and Do Jacob and Jubin and Dr. Finney is who I see on my on my panel. Yes, I don't really understand. Um, you should be, I can't. Uh, I think, shall we go ahead? Is it okay? I think it should yeah. be all right. Yeah, I just, I, I see a lot of you on my screen. That's a good thing. Okay, so I, moving forward. So precocious puberty, an overview of evaluation and management. Uh, I was told that the audience is uh, primarily medical students and uh, some pediatricians. So I'm going to try to, you know, tailor my talk such that it covers a wide uh, range of uh, trainees. Okay, hopefully uh, moving forward. Okay, so I have no relevant financial disclosures. So the objectives of my talk are uh, to review the normal progression of puberty, uh, formulate a differential diagnosis for precocious puberty, uh, plan a diagnostic evaluation to differentiate the various causes, 
um, recognize some clinical features that are associated with precocious puberty, including that caused by tumors, and also review some benign pubertal variants. Okay, so I am uh, primarily a clinician, so um, uh, I want to start by giving you a clinical scenario. So uh, try to imagine this situation where you have a six-year-old boy uh, presenting to your office. Uh, this is a very typical patient that I see in my practice. Uh, mom feels there has been some recent change in behavior and noticed that he had developed some adult type of body odor and pubic hair. Uh, and also mentions that he seems to have been getting much taller. It's just some observations she's had. Um, you know, in terms of history, vaccines are up to date, no other significant past medical history. So uh, just sort of keep this in the back of your mind. And as we go forward, um, I'm gonna come back to this case in between. Okay, so. All right, so I'll start with the definition of uh, normal puberty. Normal puberty results from sustained mature activity of the hypothalamal pituitary gonadal axis. And this is critical. All these terms are critical. Sustained, and I'm just going to use my um, uh, laser pointer on this so that I can indicate. Um, are you able to see this on your end? Yeah. So sustained mature activity of the HPG axis, which is the hypothalamal pituitary gonadal axis. And this is really critical because each of these um, have to be present in order to call something normal puberty. Okay, it's characterized by the following. First of all, maturation of gametogenesis. Secondly, secretion of gonadal hormones, and then development of secondary sexual characteristics. Okay, so what is normal puberty? Is there a trigger that sets off puberty? Really not. We don't have a single trigger for the onset of puberty. Uh, there is, though, a gradual increase in the pulsatility of GnRH. GnRH is gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which is secreted by in the hypothalamus. So this is where I would like a little bit of audience involvement. Um, if you would like to type in your chat boxes, Norm, I'll, I'll, I'll use the help of our moderator, uh, Dr. Finney, and perhaps Dr. Jacob as well. What is the normal rate of growth in a prepubertal child? You can tell me in inches or centimeters. What, what do you think? How many centimeters or inches should a, a pre-pubertal child be growing at? I'm gonna just wait a few seconds to see if I get any responses. Um, and then I just want to get a feel for what your thoughts are before I move forward. I'm not sure if any um, responses are coming up in the chat. I don't think I can see them, but. Give it a few minutes or? Centimeters in a year. Sorry? Is it five centimeters in a year? That's one of the responses, five centimeters per year. Yeah, exactly. It's about two inches or four to six centimeters a year. Um, and that's uh, critical to understand again, because that's something that puberty does is, uh, you know, growth acceleration is something you do see during puberty. And I'll go over that in more detail, but prepubertal growth velocity is about four to six centimeters a year. Uh, peak growth velocity in boys is about nine and a half centimeters a year. In girls, it's around eight to eight and a half. Uh, and really, this uh, happens a little bit later in boys and a little bit earlier in girls. Girls, it happens right before um, the onset of thelarchy usually. And in boys, it's a little bit later in their, in their, in their pubertal progression. And I'm, uh, that'll be what we go on next. Okay, another question. What is the first sign of puberty in a boy or a male? Okay, I'll give you a few seconds. Dear students, please respond. We have one response, Shabana. Yeah. Can you read it? I, I can't read anything. Okay, that's it's testicular enlargement. That's a, one of the responses. Okay, okay. That's anything else or? Hair okay. growth, somebody has mentioned hair growth. Hair growth, okay. So we have a couple of responses. And the first sign of puberty in a female, any, any takers? Breast enlargement is one of the responses. Okay. The same response again. Same breast. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. So actually, yes. Uh, in fact, the first sign of puberty in a boy is um, testicular enlargement, and the first sign of puberty in a girl is actually breast development. So. The next, uh, next few slides, again, uh, this will be familiar to a lot of you, but just to cover um, you know, various uh, uh, levels of training, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on terminology, just so we are very clear about the difference between puberty or true central puberty and just pubertal changes. Okay, so this is another critical uh, point to get clear. So puberty, what do we, when we say a child is in puberty, what are we talking about, right? So when we say puberty, we're really referring to central puberty, okay? Gonadarchy is another uh, way of uh, describing it, meaning your gonads are waking up essentially, yeah? So uh, pubertal development triggered by hypothalamic secretion of GnRH leading on to pituitary secretion of FSH and LH, which leads on to activation of the gonads, which are the ovaries and the testes, um, leading on to gonadal sex steroid production. So that is the process that needs to happen in order to consider that a child is in puberty. Okay, so if that is puberty, what is adrenarchy? What is pubarchy? And is there any difference? Do they happen together? What's, what, what, what are these two terms? So I'm going to spend a second on these. Okay, so adrenarchy is the maturation of the adrenal glands, particularly the zona reticularis, which results in increased and adrenal antigen production. The critical point here is that this is independent of the HPG axis, independent of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. This can happen on its own. So what is pubarchy? Uh, this is more semantics, but really adrenarchy and pubarchy um, sort of, you know, pubarchy sort of happens as a consequence of adrenarchy. It's the, essentially the development of pubic hair that results uh, from exposure to androgen production. The critical point here is that this could be androgen exposure from adrenal glands, ovaries, or testicles. So this is just a term to define or to describe development of pubic hair resulting from androgens from any of these sources, okay? So uh, you want to remember that although temporarily related, meaning they happen close to each other, usually gonadarchy and adrenarchy are physiologically distinct events. Uh, I do want to just um, clarify, are you able to See my whole slide, or is it blocked by, by a window box? Okay, so the window box is just me. We see your slide. It says remember, not temporarily related. Yes. Okay. I I I'm not able to see my whole slide. I see four windows. I see Jacob's blank. Uh, okay. So this is another question, uh, again, something to think about. Can an individual, can an individual rather, with defects in the hypothalamic pituitary axis have adrenarchy or pubarchy? Okay, along those same lines, can an individual with no adrenal function achieve gonadarchy or central puberty? So um, if you would like to give in some answers, go ahead, but essentially, what you want to think about is can can someone with defects in either of these have the other? So I, I can't hear uh, Dr. We, we have yes. The, one of them has responded yes. The other okay. three people have responded as no. Okay. So that's, that's a good point uh, to discuss really. So the answer is yes to both, right? An individual who has defects in the hypothalamic pituitary axis can have adrenarchy. The adrenal glands can wake up on its, you know, for, due to separate or uh, different etiologies. Uh, along the same lines, an individual who has no adrenal function may achieve gonadarchy. They may not have, you know, sufficient realization, et cetera, but that can happen. Okay, you don't need one or the other in order for these two processes to happen. They are the physiologically distinct uh, events. Okay, and of course, thelarchy is the uh, is breast development. And really, when we say someone has thelarchy, all we are saying is that it is estrogen dependent development of glandular uh, breast tissue. Again, this may or may not be HPG axis driven. All it tells us is that there is some breast development. When a child has breast development, all we know at that point is that there's been exposure to estrogen. Um, and we don't know if that estrogen has come. Um, out of true central puberty, or is it just due to exposure from exogenous sources, or is it from an ovarian cyst, et cetera? Okay, menarche is the onset of first menstrual bleed, and spermarche is the time of 
first sperm production, nocturnal sperm emissions, and a lot of people consider spermarchy to be sort of the male equivalent of uh, menarche. Okay, so now that we've gone through some uh, terminology, hopefully that's clear. Um, we will go on to normal pubertal progression. What, uh, what do we expect to see in a child? We need to be clear about this so that we know what's abnormal, okay? So what are the physical changes related to gonadarchy or true um, early puberty in, uh, or true puberty rather, in a girl, right? The first sign as you all um, uh, typed in is thelarchy or the onset of breast development. The next sign is a growth spurt. And usually this spurt in girls happens, like I said, right before menarche. You could have up to 20 to 25 centimeters of growth during a, a, a pubertal growth spurt. Bone age advancement is another um, uh, very uh, significant effect of pubertal changes. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. And menarche is sort of the end or the last phase of pubertal changes in a girl. It usually happens roughly two to three years after the onset of thelarchy. So if a girl has breast buds due to true puberty, you can expect a period roughly between two to three years after the onset. Okay, and, I, and I'm not sure how clear this is on your end, but uh, this is actually a picture of an unestrogenized hymen um, of a prepubertal child. Uh, so when we, have, when we evaluate a child in the clinic who is prepubertal, say a six or seven year old girl, uh, we look to see if the vaginal mucosa has any um, has been exposed to estrogen. Usually, it looks a little reddish or pink. In contrast to the thick um, estrogenized hymen um, in an adolescent uh, child, that thicker and pale uh, due to exposure to estrogen. All right. So, go moving on to physical changes related to gonadarchy or true central puberty in boys. So the first sign is testes enlargement, as you all suggested. And this is really the first sign to suspect the onset of puberty in a boy. Um, and we'll talk about age of onset in, in a second, but this is the first sign that you want to see. Uh, the second sign, or this can happen um, sort of at varied times, but pubarchy and penile enlargement usually follows testicular enlargement. Boys have a significant growth spurt through puberty, uh, anywhere from 25 to 30 centimeters through that course. Again, bone age advancement um, is a significant effect. Breaking of voice, um, as you all might, might know, and then of course other symptoms like acne, increasing muscle mass, which are usually um, effects of testosterone exposure. Okay, and this is something, I call this endocrine jewelry. Uh, this is essentially our Prader orchidometer. We all carry this in our pockets. This one's mine here. So, so these are, this is essentially a quick way for us to assess in the clinic what the testicular size is. In a child who comes in with possible early puberty, you want to measure the testicular size. This is a rough way to measure, you know, up to three, I don't know if you can see, but that's a prepubertal testicle. And then, you know, as it starts to increase four centimeters and above, that's when we can say that there has been testicular enlargement. And this is known as the Prader orchidometer. Okay, so, and that's, um, you know, tannous staging uh, in males. I'm going to briefly uh, go over this. Uh, this is um, an example of how we do a testicular measurement uh, in the clinic. Uh, uh, Tanner staging in males, in the interest of time, I'll just briefly cover. It's essentially stage one through five. Stage one is a prepubertal uh, Tanner stage for pubic hair, and stage five is a fully uh, developed adult male. Uh, this is for pubic hair development as well as testicular size. Tanner staging in females, uh, you all might be familiar with this. <laughs> it's essentially, again, stage one through five. Stage one is essentially prepubertal um, with no pubic hair development. And stage five is a fully mature breast with uh, adult type of pubic hair distribution. Let's see. So I've been talking about bone age advancement, um, as you might recall from the previous slides, because this is really a, a critical role um, rather, puberty plays a critical role in the advancement of the bone age. So what are we talking about when we say bone age, right? So growth plates gradually mature throughout puberty and uh, leads on to epi epiphyseal fusion, right? This is an estrogen dependent process. And earlier the onset of puberty, earlier the skeleton matures. Uh, and growth potential can be assessed by bone age, and how do we do a bone age? So we have a child coming in, we want to see how long they've been exposed to uh, sex steroids essentially, right? So we use uh, this, this is actually a photograph of the old atlas uh, that we use to this day. We have this in our clinics, the radiologists use it. It's the radiographic atlas for 
Um, it's the Village and Pile Atlas, and really it's a compilation of uh, uh, standardized x-rays of children. Now, uh, granted, these are Caucasian children, so how relevant is it to use this to compare to children of different ethnicities? As we see in the US, it's, uh, that's, that's of course debatable, but really this is the only thing we have. Um, what this does is it uses, um, it gives us a way to assess biological and structural maturity of patients. We usually use a hand and wrist x-ray, usually the non-dominant hand, and then we compare to standardized versions in this atlas and we give, get a bone age read. So for example, a child who is say six years old, who is exposed to uh, pubertal sex steroids, uh, that child may have a bone age of eight or nine whereas the chronologic age is six. So we use chronologic age versus bone age to um, assess the predicted adult height. Again, this, uh, again, uh, th this sort of shows us how, you know, in a three-year-old or a six-year-old child, there is progressive changes. Um, you can see progressive changes in the bone structures in the hand and wrist, particularly the uh, carpal bones, the radius and ulna, and also some of these um, distal epiphyses, these growth plates, as you can see, they continue to fuse and that's an 18 year old child. So there's a significant change as we go from three to six compared to a completely mature uh, child's hand. Okay, so, so coming to what we're talking about today is, is precocious puberty or early puberty, right? So what exactly, um, what are these factors? And I think Dr. Finney had mentioned in the introduction too, what are the factors that uh, influence the timing of puberty. Pubertal timing is complex. A lot of factors do influence it. There's nutrition, there's environmental influence. Uh, it's pretty well established now that ethnicity has a different, has a very significant role to play. Uh, and genes, this is actually very um, uh, exciting in terms of uh, uh, research outcomes now. There's a lot of new genes that have been uh, implicated in the, um, in the onset of puberty. So there are a lot of factors that go into pubertal timing. But since we're talking about precocious puberty or early puberty, I'm going to spend a second uh, looking at the, uh, what, what do we mean by precocious, right? Precocious is an adjective that is used uh, to describe a child who is unusually advanced or mature for that age in development. Okay, and so essentially by, uh, by, by definition, precocious puberty is the onset of pubertal development at an age which is about two and a half standard deviations earlier than the population norms. All right, so now why are we worried about it? Why do we want to talk about it? So what if a child has early puberty, right? Because so the reason precocious puberty is significant is because on the one end, it might be a normal variant. On the other end, it may be a pathologic cause which, has, uh, which could be associated with significant morbidity and mortality. So that's the relevance of um, assessing a child with early pubertal changes. So when do you consider a child to have precocious pubertal changes, right? Notice I didn't say precocious puberty, I just said precocious changes. In males, any child less than nine years, if there are precocious or early pubertal changes, you do want to evaluate. In females, if a child is less than eight years, you do want to evaluate for what's going on. Now, this definition um, is changing a little bit uh, considering you know, the onset of thelarchy between six and seven years. And I'll touch on that in a second. When I, that's why I'm gonna talk about epidemiology a little bit because uh, this is a controversial and a varies among populations. It's difficult for us to really establish a clear threshold for ethnicities. Uh, there has been a suggested threshold of uh, seven years in white girls and six years in African-American girls. And certainly in my practice, I do see there, you know, a strong, there'll be a strong family history of early puberty and these kids start the pubertal process a lot earlier, but the ultimate adult height is not affected, right? So, there, so the, you know, as we get more and more data, I think we'll have clearer cutoffs as to when do we need to get worried about a child presenting with early thelarchy in a, in, a, in a girl especially. Okay, so along these lines, why is precocious puberty a concern? Now, we... We, we had already said it may be a sign of underlying disease, right? That's the most um, um, pressing issue. Uh, and the more common issue really is premature bone maturation leading to adult short stature. So this is 
what um, a huge chunk of our patients actually are coming in because uh, they have premature bone maturation and it leads on to adult st short stature because as we, uh, uh, you know, as I referred to earlier, puberty plays a significant role in advancing uh, the bone age. So the other reason for treatment or evaluation and management is psychological impact of earlier development and early menses. So even though there may not be an underlying true pathology, there will be, you know, you could see premature bone maturation leading to significant um, uh, compromise of adult stature, or it could, you could have psychological impact of early development and early menses in a child, especially, uh, you know, this is honestly more, um, maybe more uh, relevant in a child who's already got some cognitive issues, and this is going to be another added um, uh, strain on the family and the child. Okay, so what are the causes of early pubertal changes? So this is what we want to know, right? What, so you've got, you, you know when it's early, you've got a child, think of that case that I uh, had presented to you in the, in the beginning. Six-year-old boy seemed to have some early pubertal changes. Uh, he's less than nine, so that's early, right? And you, we, at this point, all we know is that he has early pubertal changes. We don't know what is causing those. So let's talk a little bit. I'm going to broadly, uh, you know, categorize uh, the causes of early puberty into central precocious puberty, peripheral precocity, meaning uh, precocious uh, changes happening out of exposure from the periphery, and some benign pubertal variants. Okay. Quick uh, recap on what is central precocious puberty. Central precocious puberty means puberty happening early with the activation of the HP gonadal axis with GnRH secretion leading to LH and FSH secretion. So this is the underlying um, um, pathophysiology, right? Peripheral precocity is precocious uh, changes happening due to excess sex, sex steroid production. In this case, you have suppression of the HP gonadal axis. So you actually will have suppression of LH and FSH, okay? And then you have benign pubertal variants. This is very uh, important to understand because we have to rule out, we, we essentially rule out benign variant, uh, rule out uh, pathology, and then we can say this is a benign variant. So unknown uh, uh, pathology, the unknown uh, physiology underlying, but it's associated with sort of an incomplete activation of the HP gonadal axis. So there's three broad categories. So again, I'm gonna bring your attention back to that patient in the clinic, right? Six-year-old boy, with early pubertal changes, he could have any of these. He could have central precocious puberty, he could have just some precocious changes due to exposure from the periphery, or he could have a benign variant, right? So before I go on to the pathology, I'm going to spend a few minutes on the benign pubertal variants, because if a child comes in, what you want to know is, is this just a benign variant or not? So I'll go over the clinical features of uh, benign pubertal variants. There are mainly two uh, benign variants. The first of this, is benign premature thylaki. Okay, this is usually uh, associated with isolated breast development, normal growth velocity, and typically is seen in girls under three years. Um, in the literature, you could see uh, cases of benign premature thylaki anywhere from you know three up to age seven even. Okay, the the some of the uh, the key factors here are that the bone age is usually normal. So if you did an X-ray, say a four-year-old three or four year old girl came in and you did a bone age, usually that would be normal. It, it's usually not advanced. And usually there's no other evaluation needed unless you see clear clinical progression, uh, meaning your know, breast development. We, what I usually do is I see these patients in the clinic a few times and then see if there's actual progression of puberty. Okay, so this is an example. I, so you want to rule out <coughs> exposure to estrogen creams, placental extracts, hair products, lavender or tea tree oil. These are actually, um, uh, what we call, they, they contain what's called phytoestrogen, so it can cause some breast development. Uh, this is a picture of a child actually who had um, exposure to uh, placental extract, so something that's used. Um, so in, in, the, in the US, in the African-American population, they, there is uh, sometimes some, you know, a tendency to have product used in the hair for more luscious hair growth, and they, there's something called placental extracts that they can actually purchase, and these have been found to have some estrogenic products which leads to some breast development. And when you stop using the product, it goes away as expected. And another thing with all these uh, essential oils, et cetera, lavender tea tree oils, some kids are sort of taking a bath in these oils every night due to their parents' uh, 
using it. And that can also cause some rest development. So in these cases, really what you want to do is just you know, rule out, uh, eliminate the exposure. And now with Amazon easily available, you get all these um, scalp and baby hair enrichment products that you can buy. And really there's no uh, list of ingredients, but I'm sure there's some of some of the products in you know some of the contents of these products probably do relate to um, causing some of these changes. So we usually will kind of do a, an extensive history of what they've been using and try to eliminate in some cases. Okay, so what is benign uh, premature adrenarche? So we went over benign premature thelaki, and so benign premature adrenarche is the appearance of sexual hair. Um, in, eight, in girls under eight years and in boys under age nine. So eight and nine are the cutoffs generally for girls and boys. Um, the, the critical uh, features here are that the gonads are prepubertal in size and there is no breast development in girls. Okay. All right, so let me just move forward. Typical age of onset is usually between four and eight years. Usually we have um, a six or seven year old girl coming in because the parents are worried that there's been some pubic hair or axillary hair development. Uh, we definitely see this more commonly in the African-American and Hispanic population here in our practice. Uh, a lot of this association with obesity and insulin resistance. In these cases, really the bone age, if you did a bone age on these kids, it may be up to two years advanced compared to the chronologic age. So for example, a six-year-old girl may have a bone age of about eight. Uh, and earlier, you know, we would consider one year plus or minus as normal, but up to two years, you could see in Vinahan premature adrenarche. And really we only pursue investigation if there's been significant progressive realization. Uh, we usually check something called an adrenal androgen panel uh, or a premature adrenarche panel. Uh, which would show a mild elevation in DHEA sulfate, which is the predominant uh, androgen secreted by the uh, adrenal glands. And usually the other androgens are prepubertal levels. Again, it does not uh, progress typically. Okay, so what is benign premature testilarchy? So we've had benign premature telarchy, we've had benign um, premature adenarchy. So this is just to make sure I'm have you listening, but there's no such thing. An enlarged testes under nine years is abnormal. If you have a boy with enlargement of testicles under age nine, there is further evaluation warranted. So benign uh, variants are essentially just benign thelarchy and benign adrenarche. There's usually no progression of the clinical features. Okay, so this is sort of an overview of the diagnosis. What do you need in order to uh, consider the child has central precocious puberty? So in girls, there needs to be bilateral progressive thelaki. Progressive is uh, an important term here before age eight years. In boys, so usually symmetrical testicular size increase, that is four ml and above below age eight, uh, below age nine, an advanced bone age compared to chronologic age. This again is, it really depends on when you pick up the kid in the sense that if you have a child coming in really early, that bone age may not be as advanced as you expect because it's probably still early in the process, okay? Uh, you will see an accelerated growth rate. Typically, again, this depends on how much exposure there's been. And if you check your gonadotropins, namely LH and FSH, LH will be in the pubertal range. Typically that's considered above 0.3 uh, MIU per liters, or you might have to do a GnRH stimulation test and you get a peak LH of about three to five. Okay, so coming back to underlying causes now, we've kind of gone over, again, thinking about this uh, patient in my clinical scenario that I gave you, you have a six-year-old boy who comes in with early pubertal changes. You know that it's, uh, it's precocious, and now you know the underlying sort of um, pathophysiology of the three causes, and of course the benign variants, right? So we want to think about what are the what could the underlying causes be? We still don't know if it's central or peripheral. We just need to know what are the possible underlying causes that we can uh, formulate a workup. So central precocious puberty is caused by commonly by CNS tumors or malformations. It could be caused by CNS trauma or history of irradiation. So a, a good history is critical here. Um, the key point here is that it is, while it's idiopathic central precocious puberty in most girls, which is a good thing. So girls coming in with early uh, pubertal changes, if it's truly central puberty, 90% of the time, 80 to 90% of the time, it is idiopathic. Not the same for boys. 
Okay, it is idiopathic only in 25 to 50% of boys. And hence, they, you know, a boy coming in with true central puberty does need further workup for a CNS tumor, CNS malformation. All right, so moving on to peripheral precocity. Now this, the causes are extensive. Um, we, could you, we could actually do a whole separate talk on each of these causes, but I, I'll briefly go over the broad uh, category. So if you have a child with exposure to uh, sexual uh, steroids from the periphery, we're talking about adrenal, ovarian, or testicular tumors. It could be an ovarian cyst. It could be autonomous uh, gonadal activation, such as in mccune albright syndrome, as you might be familiar, testotoxicosis. Uh, the most common cause is CAH, or congenital adrenal hypoplasia. You could have exogenous exposure, that there have been kids who come in with a lot of fertilization due to exposure to parental or someone in the family that's using testosterone gel, uh, and the kids have been exposed to it and they just have peripheral uh, fertilization just from that. Um, and you could have severe hypothyroidism and the, um, if you have very, very high TSH levels, uh, there is, uh, some of these kids can come with peripheral precocity because of the cross-reactivity of that um, uh, TSH with the LH receptor. Okay, and benign variants. You have premature tilaki and premature adenaki. We kind of went over that already. What are the features of those? Right. Okay, moving on. So we have this kid in your office, right? Your six-year-old. Um, keep that in mind um, as, as much as you can. So you have this child, six-year-old boy with early pubertal changes. So what do you look for on, on physical exam? All you know at this point is there are some early pubertal changes, some adrenal, um, we haven't done an exam, so you don't know if he has testicular enlargement. All you know, he's got some pubic hair, some, some, some adult body odor and a little bit of rapid growth velocity, right? So on your exam, you're looking, of course, first thing is growth velocity. You do a complete head to toe exam to look for cutaneous markers, perhaps any signs of things like uh, McKeon Albright syndrome or neurofibromatosis, really any dysmorphia. All right, you do a testicular exam and you do tannal staging, of course. Testicular exam is, of course, what you're looking for. You need to see are those testicles four cc's and above? He's six. They should not be four cc's. Okay. Androgen effects um, like fertilization and estrogen effects like breast development if it's a girl. All right, so further evaluation. Again, we talked about a bone age x ray. Right, so a boy who's six, if you do a bone age x-ray and if he's been exposed to, to um, androgens for a while or estrogens for that matter, he could have an advanced bone age of eight or nine. Right, and this helps with uh, the differential. It also helps on looking at the impact on the final height. So what's the next step? You've done an evaluation uh, and I'll uh, show you what we found, but <clears throat> you do a first morning LH and FSH. You check estradiol levels usually, testosterone levels and adrenal markers. If you have a child with early pubertal changes with LH in the prepubertal range, this could be one of two things. Either it's a benign pubertal variant or if it could be a peripheral precocity, meaning the exposure to, to androgens or estrogens has suppressed the FSH and LH. If you have non-diagnostic borderline LH levels, which happens a lot, then the next step is to do a luprolide or a GnRH agonist stimulation test. All right. Other tests that we do uh, in boys, uh, you might want to do an HCG level to look for an HCG secreting tumor. Uh, TSH level if chronic uh, primary hypothyroidism is suspected, because that can also cross react and lead to uh, um, a child with severe hypothyroidism can have a presentation of early uh, puberty because of that cross reaction between TSH and LH, or because the because the uh, molecules are very similar. Further imaging, if you recall the, the causes of early puberty, right? most of them, if, if you have a boy who has true early puberty, true central puberty, most of the causes are something in the CNS. So you need to have a brain, of the, an MRI of the brain in all boys with central precocious puberty. Girls, this is a little more controversial. Currently in our practice, we uh, do an MRI in all girls, less than six. Between six and seven is a gray zone especially if there's a strong family history of early puberty. Like I said, 80 to 90% of these girls have idiopathic central precocious puberty. So we try to avoid an MRI if we can, um, because it does cause a lot of anxiety for the family, of course, cost, et cetera. 
So all girls who are less than six, we do get an MRI, but if they're between six and eight, we really look at the whole clinical picture before we decide on getting an MRI. Right, a pelvic ultrasound is something to consider in a girl uh, because it does give us an idea of whether the um, uterus and the ovaries are normal if there's been uh, a pubertal size of the uh, pelvic organs. So in, in, if, if you're looking at peripheral precocious puberty, then some of the imaging that you might do is again, pelvic ultrasound to look for an ovarian cyst, et cetera. You might want to look at adrenal ultrasound or CT if, um, if there's an adrenal, again, I'm gonna minimize my screen. If there's an adrenal pathology that you suspect based on that adrenal panel, you might want to get a testicular ultrasound to rule out perhaps a leading cell tumor. Okay. So back to our case, if you recall, I've been bringing him up uh, in between just to keep your um, sort of differential broad, okay? So you have a six-year-old boy who presents to your office. As mom feels he's had some recent change in behavior, notice some adult type body odor, pubic hair, also has been getting much taller. Again, vaccines are up to date. He's really been healthy otherwise. This is actually a patient I saw in clinic maybe a month ago. All right. Okay, he's had no complaints of headaches. Nobody in the house has been using you know, testosterone gel, really no known exposure to androgen containing products. He has had no history of head trauma or irradiation. Okay, so if you can look at his, if you can see his growth chart here, he has crossed two percentiles in height over the past two years. If you can see, again, I'm gonna use my pointer here, it might be easier. So he has been steadily growing along this curve Right, and then suddenly he had this rapid acceleration of growth. Okay, so that's significant because a child, as all you pediatricians will be familiar with, will, you know, when a child picks a growth curve or picks a growth trajectory, he is going to, he or she is going to stick to that growth curve very religiously um, until growth is complete. So there's, so if there's been such significant increase in growth velocity, that's certainly something to be worried about. So what do you want to look for on physical exam? You've done, he's come to your office, you've got his growth data, he's been growing fast, mom has been giving you some symptoms. What do you want to see on physical exam? Is he in true puberty or not, right? If he's truly in puberty or not. So here is his uh, physical exam. So his vitals were normal for age, all right? There were no neurocutaneous markers. Um, he had pubic hair, tennis stage three to four. Again, this is a six-year-old boy. Okay, and his testes were 10 cc's. So that's again for time of stage reference, he was at a three to four pubic hair stage and his testes were 10 cc's. Okay, so that's about, if you want to look at my problem, okay, that's about somewhere here. Okay, this is for reference, this is pre pubertal and that's where he was. He should be pre pubertal, but this is, this is testicular size actually here. All right. So you've got a boy now with growth acceleration. He's got pubic hair, uh, you know, in tennis stage three or four and enlarged testes. So we want to get a bone age next, right? So we, his bone age was 11 years. So that's advanced. He was six, but his bones were 11. All right, and his, we got his blood work or his labs and his LH was clearly in a pubertal range, not suppressed, not equivocal. FSH was 1.5. His testosterone was 480, which was which is essentially what we would expect in a teenage boy, and he's six, right? And um, the 70 hydroxyprogesterone is normally always do the whole panel to make sure it's you know the, the most common cause of peripheral precocity is CAH, so we always get an adrenal panel. Okay, so what do you think? Does he likely have central puberty or peripheral precocious puberty? And what would you like to order next? If everyone's still listening, I will. Wait a few seconds for some answers. So you've got the six-year-old child with early pubertal changes on exam. You have testicular enlargement. You have pubic hair development stage three to four. He's got advanced bone age. He's growing rapidly. The majority of the responses are central. There is one response saying peripheral, but all of them, almost everybody says central. Okay. All right, so of course this is this was a pretty clear. Uh, I'm not sure why this is. Uh, this is a pretty clear uh, case of central, really. Okay, his bone age was central. So 
if you look at the underlying causes, so central precocious puberty, uh, CNS tumors and malformations are the predominant uh, etiology in a boy. Um, in, in girls, of course, like I said, it's idiopathic, but this is a boy. So we're looking at CNS tubers and malformations. So what, do you, what would you like to order next in this kid? Again, that's a question for you. So any takers? We have two responses saying MRI of the brain. Okay, yeah. So that's that's kind of that's our next step. So he had an MRI of his brain, and that was this is actually uh, an MRI of my patient from last month. Uh, he had, if you can see, a hypothalamic tumor there. He had a hypothalamic hematoma. Uh, this is pretty much uh, a very classic lesion that you find in boys with uh, central precocious puberty. Approach is quite difficult. So again, the next step here is to send them to a neurosurgeon to, uh, to, to uh, manage the neurosurgical part if he's a candidate for surgery, et cetera. But most of these kids are usually not treated with surgery depending on, uh, that's at the discretion of a neurosurgeon. Uh, it does not change our approach to managing or suppressing the pubertal changes. So. So CN, you know, central precocious puberty that's secondary to a CNS lesion. Typically, I'm trying to minimize my, my slide here. Pardon me. So sec. Shabana, can I, can I interject? Just can I just yes. make a comment? Yeah, we have, we have a comment from Professor Gurija Mohan, one of our pediatric professors. She says yes. that the physical examination in a girl with precocious puberty is a simple examination of the vaginal mucosa, which can give a clue of the estrogen effect. It'll be pink vaginal mucosa, whereas red mucosa when there's no estrogen effect, clinically a very helpful sign. That's a comment she has made. Absolutely, yes. And uh, I, I did uh, you know, sort of um, uh, address that right in the beginning with pubertal changes. That is a very useful sign when we, when we do an exam, if, especially for the uh, children who are, you know, we have a lot of obese uh, children now, so sometimes, Breast exams are difficult because you have a lot of lipomastia and you know, actually feeling glandular tissue is hard sometimes. So some, the, uh, uh, a vaginal exam actually is helpful. Thank you. So let me look. So we, we are at treatment now. I'm just gonna do an overview of treatment because uh, central precocious puberty and peripheral precocious puberty are really uh, two different treatment approaches. I'm gonna just do an overview of the treatment of central precocious puberty. The goal of this talk was just to be able to identify if a child is truly in precocious puberty, is, is it, and what could be, uh, at least get a broad uh, sort of differential diagnosis, right? So now treatment for central precocious puberty, if it is secondary to a CNS lesion, really it's the etiologic treatment like surgery, but this would not have any effect on the course of pubertal development. So just to, um, so in, in my patient here, what we did was, and we do this with most of our kids uh, who have central precocious puberty, we, We'll schedule the MRI because we know that's 90% of the kids, 80 to 90% are going to have a lesion. And we actually coordinate with the pediatric surgeons to have the, um, uh, the treatment implant, which I'll come to in a second, done at the same time. So as to avoid um, you know, putting, the putting the child under anesthesia twice, one for the MRI and one for the, uh, one for the uh, placement of Suprem. And I'll, come, I'll touch on that in a second. So like I mentioned before, the lesion that's most frequently associated with central precocious puberty um, has very difficult access and surgery is really re reserved for those who have say refractory epilepsy or really at the discretion of the neurosurgeon, but typically we don't uh, see most of, our, most of our kids have surgery. Okay, so now coming to treatment, I'll just spend a few seconds. This is the end of the talk really. Central precocious puberty treatment <clears throat> Since the 1980s, uh, GNRH analogs have been the mainstay of treatment. Uh, and this might seem counterintuitive because why are you giving GNRH when this child is already in puberty, right? But the underlying um, uh, mechanism is that when you give it continuously, there's a downregulation of GNRH receptors leading to loss of cyclicity of signaling. Okay, and that's really the, this is what triggers onset of puberty, if you recall from the beginning, right? There's a pulsatile GNRH. So even you lose that pulsatility, that down regulates the GNRH receptors. All right, so this is a treatment. So this would be what we use. It's um, GNRH um, analogs, it's suprelin 
um, or Lupron. Okay, so this is usually given as a monthly depot or a subcutaneous implant. The subcutaneous implant, usually we have our pediatric surgeons place it. Uh, in our patient here, he had it done at the time of his MRI, like I was saying, so that under sedation, he had the uh, implant and he had the MRI. So the implant was placed usually, you know, the implant is approved for a year, but we've found there's more data now that allows us to actually keep it in for 18 months. It seems to be working for 18 months. So oftentimes if the child is still well suppressed, we will keep it in for 18 months. Okay. All right, so again, just very broadly on peripheral precocious puberty, like I said, this is a whole lecture in itself, the whole, you know, the various causes of peripheral precocious puberty. Really the underlying um, uh, agent needs to be removed, right? For peripheral precocious puberty. You want to try to block the peripheral effects of sex hormones. Uh, some of the agents used are an androgen receptor blocker, bicalutamide, estrogen receptor blockers like tamoxifen has been tried. Um, I've had, maybe a couple of kids over the course of fellowship and my practice with McCune Albright syndrome, we've tried bacilutamide. The response, to be honest, has been not great, but we don't have too many options in these situations. All right, so, and that is uh, sort of bringing us to the end. And in summary, and I'm just gonna read off, uh, hopefully I've covered this and hopefully you, you've all uh, sort of got these uh, key points. Normal timing of puberty is dependent on multiple factors. There are well-established differences with ethnicity. Uh, precocious pubertal changes um, can be centrally mediated or peripherally mediated, right? And bottom line, testicular enlargement less than nine years in boys is abnormal. Central precocious puberty in girls, more than 90% are idiopathic. In boys, it's kind of the opposite. More than 50% are due to an underlying CNS tumor or malformation and that's the end of the talk. I'm, I'm actually not sure where we are on time, but um, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah, uh, thank you so much Shabana for the talk, it was really good. And I have a few questions in front of me, which I will start off. The first question is from our, one of our finally a medical students. Yeah. He, he has a small qu question is regarding you mentioned in the beginning that adrenarche is independent of the hypothalamogonadal axis, hypothalamo pituitary gonadal axis activation. So his question is that, doesn't the pituitary hormones like ACTH also control the adrenal cortical secretions? So can you explain how it is independent? Yes, so, uh, so the question was about whether, the, so the adrenal gland has three zones, right? The G, you know, it's, I remember it usually as G, F, and R. It's the zona glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. Salt, sugar, and sex steroids, right? When you come from outside to inside. So the reticularis is responsible for the sex steroid production. And that can happen independently. It is not under the control of, typically, I mean, ACTH can, of course, stimulate the production of cortisol, but not, if you have hypothalamo, if you have um, a deficiency in the pituitary of ACTH, of course, it can cause deficiency of adrenarche, but you can have, your, your adrenal gland can be functional on its own as well. I'm not sure if that, hopefully that answers the question, but ACTH is, we're, we're talking about cortisol secretion. The reticularis is basically, uh, you know, secreting adrenal hormones, which is, the, the predominant one is DHEA sulfate. Can I ask the next question yeah. uh, about, you mentioned that the LH levels, if they are below 0.2, it's prepubertal. Yeah. And you said if it is above 3.5, as in that particular case you presented, it's definitely pubertal response, LH. What is the unequivocal zone in your, in your definition? So anywhere from, so typically if it's clearly above 0.3 and LH of above 0.3, uh, then we say, okay, this is, this is, a, pu this is a pubertal LH. But if it's between 0.2 and 0.3, a lot of times when these kids come in really early, we don't have a way to confirm. Uh, so then really, this is usually in girls. In boys, if you have clear testicular enlargement, we know. But in girls, you, you before you start someone on treatment, you want to establish that it's a central process. So then we do a luprolide stem test at that point to see if we can get a response of three to five. There's different protocols. Um, uh, if you look in the literature, there's some folks do a one and three R. LH and estrogen estradiol level, and they also do a 24 hour estradiol. We just to make, to make it convenient for the families, we in our practice, we do the one, one hour 
um, LH and estradiol. So I'm not sure what, what you have at your institute. Um, I, maybe someone can enlighten me on what you, what, what you all do there, but. The next, quest, uh, the next question is, how do you assess bone age uh, practically in the clinic? And what is its relevance? I think you've answered it about using rulish file charts, but you want to yeah. just elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, of course. So the first thing that you, so this is a very useful tool in any child that you have. So you say you see um, a seven-year-old girl, right? Six to seven-year-old girl. Um, she is, she, and she has some early breast development and really not progressing very rapidly, not growing rapidly yet, just some early breast development. So one, what, what you, what, how do you want to address that to the family? You want to look at what are the problems, right? If she started puberty early, there's two major issues. One, in a girl, the good thing is 90% are idiopathic, right? Two, is, is that early puberty going to compromise her final adult height? And three, is that early puberty going to put her at significant distress due to an early menses? Okay, so what at that point, a very useful tool is a bone age x-ray. We get the x-ray of the left hand, typically a non-dominant hand, and we look to see if it's advanced. So if she's seven and her bones are 11, then you're like, you know, that means she's been exposed to it for much longer. Her predicted height is going to be much shorter than four foot 11, which is an acceptable height for a girl. In that case, then you would say, okay, this is worth treating if it is truly central precocious puberty. You would have to do the whole evaluation, but that's where the bone age comes in. It's very, is useful. You, yeah, essentially it's, you order the, you know, x-ray of the left hand and compare with standards and look to see. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question is, if you do see on your MRI, a pedunculated hypothalamic hamartoma. Yeah. It seems to be quite easy to amenable to neurosurgical intervention. Would that have any benefit or would you not touch a pedunculated hypothalamic hamartoma? That's, that's really not my wheelhouse, but uh, again, I refer, I refer to the surgeons. If the surgeons feel that it's an easy approach and then you have a discussion with the family, and remove, usually even removing that will not, you know, the, the, the kids still need to be on treatment. So prelin is still required. So that neurosurgical, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're putting a patient through neurosurgical treatment, you're also risking possibly affecting another, depending on where it is, you're also possibly risking other pituitary deficiencies, depending on how well the neurosurgeon does it, et cetera. So I, you know, in terms of product, if it's easily approachable, then suddenly the neurosurgeon might suggest doing it, but that doesn't change our treatment in terms of, you know, actually suppressing the, the process. There is a question about benign variants. Yeah. And it says, why are CNS tumors not considered a benign variant? I think, um, I mean, benign variants will not have an any obvious cause, right? There yes. will be, it's just that thing for it. So I think this, this question is not probably appropriate in a sense, right? Yeah. I guess you, if, if you mean if the CNS uh, lesion is benign, can you call that a benign variant? Yeah, no, that's, because... that's probably what they're asking. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. Many I see people, some. There's a lot of abuse of uh, broiler chickens in the community. We use, we nowadays, we hardly have the typical country chickens being available. Now, many people are worried about the hormonal injections into these chicks. And yeah. that, do you think that's leading to a lot of precocious, pre sexual precocity? Or it, comment on any of the other common endocrine disruptors, which you would, you see in practice? You did mention a few. Yeah, that those are the, usually the ones. I mean, of course, obesity is supposed, is the only real factor that we have seen that's associated with earlier onset of puberty. That being said, although uh, precocity, you know, earlier onset of puberty, meaning early breast development, is happening, the age of onset of menarche hasn't changed that much. It's maybe within, it's still within six months of the 12 and a half cutoff that we used to have before. So it's just the onset, and that's why we think it's more environmental. The progression, rate of progression has not, has, has sort of equalized. And then it, the, the kids really, the, the menarchal age is usually 12 to 12 and a half, even though they've started earlier. So this, it's possible that these, the, the endocrine disruptors that we see in the US typically is these lavender oils and tea tree oils, a lot of these placental extracts, hormonal, these creams that people buy online and really we don't know what's in them. Um, obesity, of course, is a huge factor. Uh, in terms of these broiler chickens, that certainly could be. There's no, you know, there's no RCT that you can do to study this, right? You can only do an association study. 
uh, to see if this is something that you can attribute to it. But it certainly could play a role, and that's that's all we are at at the moment. Yeah. Yes, I, actually, I can see the. You can see the chat, is it, or you I can't? See, I wasn't sure if I could. Uh, I saw some answers. How to assess bone age? Yeah, we talked about yeah, that. I think we have covered most of the questions. Okay, yeah. Maybe one last question as to how do you monitor people once you put them on a GNRH analog like Leuprolite? How do you, what, what is your algorithm to follow up these patients in the days to come? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, you know, the, again, different practices do it a little bit differently. Um, now there's more and more evidence that we should really be only following them clinically. We start them on treatment. I usually will get one level at maybe the three month follow up to see if the LH levels are suppressed, if the estradiol is suppressed. What I usually will do uh, quite regularly is get a bone age at six months to see if the bone age is not advanced. So for example, if a child had a bone age of 10 to start with, six months later, you want to see that the bone age is not advanced further, which means your treatment is working, right? Because the bone age is what tells you the predicted adult height. So we don't usually get, um, I personally, just based on recent literature, I don't get LH levels every single time. Uh, it also depends on the formulation that the child is on. If the kid is on suprelin, um, you'd want to do a, you know, a stimulation test maybe at six months and see if the post level is pubertal or not, right, the LH level. But there's more and more studies coming out that really you want to just follow clinically. Um, uh, just monitor them clinically, look at growth velocity. Those are the key factors. Progression of pubertal, you know, breast development, uh, growth velocity, just to make sure that it's not at a pubertal rate and advancement of bone age. We try not to use um, markers like LH and estradiol because they have not been found to be very reliable. And also avoid the second poke for the baby, you know, or the kid rather. There is a question from one of our students. Why is the x-ray of the non-dominant hand taken? Wouldn't the x-rays of both hands be the same? That's the question. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, like I said, you know, the religion pile atlas is not, is not the best thing to use. It's, it's a bunch of Caucasian children, right? And they've compiled all these and they used for consistency, they used the left hand. So in order to keep that as consistent as possible, we use the left hand in a, in a child. I mean, uh, and, and non, when you say non-dominant, it's because the left hand was used. Now, do I ask every child if they are left-handed or right-handed? I'll be honest, I don't. I just order a bone age x-ray and the radiologist usually will do it on the left hand, just for consistency. So this is um, not a great reason why it's right or left hand. This is for consistency based on the available data that we have. We should um, hopefully have an updated atlas with you know different ethnicities, but uh, as far as I know, that's there's, there's none in the works. Yeah. I'm trying to see the chat too. Yeah. We will ask with one last question. I don't see any other questions on the chat. Uh, okay. You have experience in using medroxyprogesterone acetate in some of the patients you've had with precocity, uh, sexual, um, sorry, uh, the peripheral precocity. And do you also have used patients, have you used spironolactone and flutamide in some of your young boys who have got a sexual precocity? So yeah, flutamide, yes. We've, I've used it maybe once in a child um, earlier, but it was due to testotoxicosis, yeah. you know, peripheral precocity. But that's really the only time I've used it. It wasn't, it didn't work very well. And he ended up having, you know, pretty compromised height because of the exposure for so long. But that's, I've used, I have not used medroxyprogesterone acetate, but flutamide, yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So thank you very much, Shabana. It's been a pleasure okay. having you. And I think it's been most enlightening, the talk. And I want to hand it back to Jacob to say a few concluding remarks. Oh, sure. yeah. So thank you, Shabana, for that wonderful presentation. Oh, thanks, Jacob. We really enjoyed your session. And uh, it was very interactive. That was the highlight. And um, uh, thank you for taking time off and uh, coming live for us. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Philip Finney for moderating the session. Uh, thank you for coming over, sir, and uh, all our delegates and students, faculty for tuning in. And we are really uh, happy that you all came in and uh, interacted the way we did and uh, came out with a lot of deliberations also. So happy with that. And let's go ahead and uh, do more presentations like this, more discussions like this in future. So uh, until we meet you for another webinar, 
we sign off. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharbana. Yes. And thank you for helping moderate. Thank you.